Hi everybody, this is Max and uh, today I wanted to show you guys how you can make a custom slider in Webflow without writing any custom code. Uh, so this slider has some controls, uh, some buttons on the left side here that will go to a specific slide. And uh, on the right side here you have some arrows that will go to the previous and next slide. Uh, there is also a neat trick here that will make you able, when you reach the end of the slides, to loop back to the first one and create an infinite loop. So here in Webflow I just wanted to make a short introduction of some key concepts that I'm using for the slider to work uh, before I just dive into the project. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is the transfer move property when using percentages. It seems a bit counterintuitive at first but the transfer percentage is not calculated from the parent but it's actually calculated from the element itself. I set up a little interaction just to show you what I mean by that. So here you have like a 50% transforms that is applied to all those blocks. But as you can see, like the smaller it is, the less it moves. So it's like using 50% of its own width to transform to the right. The next concept that I want to illustrate is the combination between Flexbox and Overflow. When you set up an element to display flex horizontal, it will need to know its width to calculate how the flex item should be laid out within itself. The same thing will go with the height for the flex vertical. It means that the width will be set, either by you in percent or pixel or whatever unit you prefer to use, or by default auto will be the same thing as you setting 100% of the parent. And all the magic is there. If you set the flex items to don't shrink, they will have a fixed width that you can define. If the sum of their width is bigger than the flex parent, they will start overflowing from it, but you will keep the flex behavior. In this setup, you can see how I use this concept to have all the flex item overflowing from the flex parent. And I could use the flex parent for the transform, and I will have the flex item as the different slide of my slider. And if you put all of that inside a div and you set the overflow of that div to hidden, you will end up having a mask acting as a sort of viewport where you can display the different slides. Again, I set up a little animation to illustrate what happened when you transform the flex parent. As you can see, transforming the flex parents from minus 100 to 100% make the old stripe of slides shift inside the mask. So if you set up the flex item to 100% width and the flex parent to 100% height, you will end up with a custom slider. Okay, moving on to the project. So now that you know the key concept that I used to build this slider, uh, let me show you the structure in the navigator. So at the top level here I have a mask and this is set to the width and height I want my slider to be and the overflow property is set to hidden. Inside of it I do have my uh, slide wrapper and uh, this one is the flex parent so obviously display flex and I leave the flex layout setting to the default. I just make sure the height is 100% of the parent which is the slider mask. And finally, inside of my slides wrapper, I do have all my slides. So each slide is a flex item and it will be set to down shrink and the width 100% that will make the overflow we were seeing before. My slider is actually only composed of three slides and the two extra ones are a duplicate of the first one and the last one. The duplicate of the first one will go after the last one and the duplicate of the last one will go before the first one. Uh, I'm using symbols here to reflect changes made to those slides to the other instance. This is how later we will be able to do the looping trick I told you about with interactions. So we do have our slider now and we can use the slide wrapper to transform the overall stripe of slides. And if we go at the bottom here and the, in the designer uh, and we change the transform property, we can use percentages to shift the slides inside the mask. So because the first images you're seeing here is actually the duplicate of the last one, the first slide I'm using will be minus 100%, which make it easy to remember because minus 100% will be the first slide. And if you go a bit further, you will start to see the second one, which is minus 200%. And if you want the third one, you guessed it, it's minus 300. If you go all the way to minus 400, that will be the duplicate of the first slide at the end of the slides. Okay, let's have a look to the controls. So first, like uh, we do have some buttons on the 
uh, left hand side here and those buttons will go to the slide that is mentioned on the button so slide 2 or slide 3 and uh, those buttons are actually not buttons they are just like a text block with a, an interaction and uh, the reason I'm using text block is because I, I noticed some unexpected behavior with the uh, using the Webflow button. And I'm not exactly sure why yet, but uh, it might be because of the default behavior of a link tag messing with my interaction or so. But uh, if you know why, uh, I'll be happy to hear from you in the comment section. Next, we got the arrows. So inside of the arrows wrapper at the bottom right corner here, I do have the left and right arrow in an arrow button wrapper and inside of each of those you do have the arrow icon and the rest is just triggers. So a trigger is basically a div block so it's transparent but it's positioned to absolute and pinned to foresight with zero pixel. I'm also adding a Z index of one just to make sure the trigger will always be on top of the actual arrow icon. So the way to think about the triggers is what the left arrow is able to do. So the left arrow should be able to bring me to the last slide if I'm on the context of the first slide. It should bring me to the first slide if I'm on the second one. And if I'm on the third one, it should bring me to the slide two. Same thing goes for the right arrow. If I were on the first slide, it should bring me to slide two. If I were on the second slide, it should bring me to slide three. And if I was on the last slide, the third one, it should bring me to the first one with a loop effect. So basically, as you, as you can guess, but we're going to have a look at it in the interaction, but I will show or hide all of those triggers depending of the current context of the slider. To make sense of all of this, let's have a look to the interactions. I have one timed animation per slide plus two extra one for the loop effect. So I have an animation to go to slide one. Uh, I have an animation to go to slide two, one to go to slide three. And I also have those two uh, special ones for the loop. Okay, let's have a look to the two slide one animation. It looks a bit crowded in there, but it's actually fairly simple. The only animation that is happening is on the slides wrapper, which remember is the parent that I'm using to transform the overall stripe of slides. And I'm moving it or transforming it to the position of minus 100%. If I were to use 0%, that would be the first image of the stripe. But remember, this image is a duplicate of the last slide for the loop effect. So minus 100% is the actual position of the first slide. I'm also adding some easing and some duration on this. The next thing that should happen is hiding and showing the different trigger depending on this context. When I arrive on slide 1, the left arrow should trigger the animation to go to the last slide doing the loop effect, and the right arrow should trigger the animation to go to slide 2. So it means that the left to last trigger should be shown with display blow and the right arrow trigger to slide 2 should be display block as well. All the other trigger left to slide 1, left to slide 2, right to slide 3 and right to first are useless in this context and I hide them with the display none property. All the rest at the top here are initial state. Because I want my slider to start on the first slide, I'm just setting up the slide's wrapper position to be minus 100% when the page load, and all the trigger are the same setting as below. If you have a look to the slide 2 animation, that will be the same thing minus the initial states, of course, but the slide's wrapper will move to minus 200%. All the trigger, if you get it, it will be the left arrow will bring me to the first slide, and the right arrow should bring me to the third slide. So the left arrow to slide 1 trigger should be display block and the right arrow to slide 3 should be display block. All the other are useless and are display none. Same thing goes for the slide 3. Now let's have a look to the two first slide and the two last slide animations. Those two animations are the one that I'm using for the loop effect. Inside of the two first slide animation, you will see it's similar to the two slide 1. But the difference is that instead of having only one animation, I have two. The first animation will move the slide's wrapper to the position of minus 400%, which is actually the fifth image on the stripe. So it's the duplicate of the first slide. Just after that, I'm moving the slide's wrapper back to minus 100%, which is the actual position for the first slide. 
The trick here is just to put the duration of that animation to zero second. That way you will have an instant seamless jump. Same thing goes for the two last slide animation. You will have the slide wrapper moving to 0%, so remember this is the duplicate of the third slide. And just after that, with a 0 second duration, it will move back to minus 300%. So now most of the work is done and I just have to connect the different controls to the right interaction. So inside of the button wrapper here, I do have the first button that should lead to slide 1. And this is just about setting a mouse click interaction and on first click is going to slide one. Same thing goes for the button going to slide two, on first click is going to slide two. So all the naming start to make sense, right? Now if you go to the arrows wrapper, that's where you set up the trigger. So the left to last trigger should go to the last slide. So on first click, I'm going to last slide. If I take the left to slide one, on first click, I go to slide one, and so on and so forth. And here we are, we have a working slider. So we can use the button to go to slide two, slide three, slide one, back to slide three, or we can use the arrows to go left and right. And if you reach the end of the slide, it will loop back to the first one, indefinitely creating a loop. The good thing as well is that the arrows and the button stay in sync. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little tutorial about how to make a custom slider in the Webflow without any custom code. Uh, if you have any questions or if you have any way you could improve this slider, I will be happy that you share it in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.